welcome to episode 67 of the Giants of the Faith podcast. This is the show where we look at Christians from the last 2,000 years that have made an impact for the kingdom of God. Now over the last few episodes, we've been building up the chain of faith that leads toward Billy Graham. And we've seen how the devotion and life of Sunday school teacher Edward Kimball led to the conversion of a young D.L. Moody, and then how Moody inspired Wilbur Chapman to go into full-time evangelism, which led Chapman to giving Billy Sunday his start as an evangelist. And then that's where we pick up the chain today as we take a deeper dive into the life of Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday was born on November 19, 1862, in Ames, Iowa, to parents William and Mary Jane. William was the son of German immigrants, with the original surname Sontag, which they later anglicized to Sunday. William was a bricklayer by trade, but in August of 1682, he enlisted as a volunteer in the Iowa 23rd Volunteer Infantry for the Union Army in the American Civil War. Unfortunately for the family, he died of pneumonia four months later, when Billy was only one month old, leaving Mary Jane with three children and no husband. Now, the family moved in with Mary Jane's parents, and Billy had a very close relationship with his grandparents. Mary Jane did remarry, but her second husband abandoned the family, so when Billy was 10 years old, she sent Billy and his brother to an orphanage because she just couldn't support them. Billy credited the orphanages that he lived in for giving him structure and stability as a child. And by age 14, he was off working on his own at the farm of former Iowa Lieutenant Governor John Scott. Sunday cared for animals and did odd jobs around the farm, and he also had the chance to attend the local high school. In 1880, he moved on to Marshalltown, Iowa. There, he joined the local fire brigade and began playing baseball for the town team. And it's baseball that gave him his first big break. Cap Anson a major league player who actually still holds a record for playing in 27 straight seasons, had an aunt that lived in Marshalltown, and she told him all about Sunday's speed and his ability on the baseball field. And then Anson recommended Sunday to A.G. Spaulding, of Spaulding Sporting Goods fame, who was the president of the Chicago White Stockings of the National League, who are confusingly now known as the Chicago Cubs, not the Chicago White Sox and Spalding hired Sunday in 1883. So Sunday was a fill-in player in right field for the White Stockings, and his greatest asset was his speed. In 1885, the White Stockings set up a race between Sunday and the St. Louis Browns' Arlie Latham, who was the fastest player in the American Association of Baseball. It was a 100-yard dash, and Sunday won the race by about 3 yards. As a player, Billy enjoyed the nightlife and the drinking that came with being a baseball star. His was a fast life, on and off the base paths. But everything changed for Billy in 1886 when he attended a gospel meeting at the Pacific Garden Mission in Chicago. He was moved by the preaching of Harry Monroe, a former drunkard who had been converted at the mission. Billy gave his life to Christ and he quit drinking, and he later said, I got down on my knees and I settled it right there. And it was at the mission where he also met his future wife, Helen Thompson, or Ma Sunday as she would later be called. She was a devout Christian who supported him in his faith and in his ministry throughout his life. In 1888, Sunday was sold to the Pittsburgh Alleghenies, where he got regular playing time in center field. Now the Alleghenies were a bad team, and Sunday suffered through losing seasons in 1888 and 1889. In 1890, there was a labor dispute, and many players left the National League and formed a new league, the Players League, in a dispute over pay. Billy was invited to join them, but he felt bound by his conscience to honor his contract and stick with Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh shortly ran out of money, and Billy was sent on to the Philadelphia Phillies. He left baseball in 1891, and he became a full-time worker for the YMCA. He also joined the evangelistic team of J. Wilbur Chapman, the Presbyterian minister who taught him how to preach. You might remember Chapman from our last episode. Billy soon developed his own style of preaching, using humor, slang, gestures, and illustrations to connect with his audience. He also used music, testimonies, and personal counseling to draw people to Christ. 
Now it seems like a lot of the biographies set in this time in some way touch the YMCA, and that's with good reason. The YMCA's original mission was to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and to help young men grow in their faith and character. And they also offered educational, recreational, and social opportunities for their members. Things like libraries, gyms, classes, clubs. Now over time, the YMCA's relationship with Christianity has changed, I would say deteriorated. Some very few YMCA's have maintained a strong Christian identity and focus, while most have become more and more secular. Now, Sunday launched his own independent ministry in 1896 when Chapman returned to pastoral ministry. And one of the first Billy Sunday campaigns, using a tent, was held in Garner, Iowa in 1896. Sunday gradually gained popularity and recognition as an evangelist, and by the early 20th century, he was holding large-scale revivals in major American cities. He claimed that over the course of his career, he converted more than a million people to Christ through his ministry. He traveled across the country, holding revival meetings in tents, specially constructed tabernacles, and stadiums. And often, the churches that would invite Sunday to town would get together and build a tabernacle to house his services. Now, this is a common practice for evangelistic outreach, and Sunday used it to good effect. These tabernacles were quickly constructed temporary buildings that could house thousands of people. Now, the average one held about 7,000. And they typically had electric lighting and, when necessary, heating. And there'd be row upon row and aisle upon aisle of chairs. And the floor was typically lined with sawdust in an effort to keep excess noise down. And this is where we get the phrase, hitting the sawdust trail, as a reference to folks responding to the invitation and walking up the sawdust-covered aisles toward the front of the building. These evangelistic meetings, they were a real event that took months of planning and promotion to pull off. Now, if you check out Romans1015.com that I've linked in the show notes, you can see some photos of these tabernacles. A Sunday preached to millions of people, from farmers to factory workers, cowboys to college students. He spoke on topics such as sin, salvation, heaven, hell, Bible, prayer, family, morality, and social issues. He was especially passionate about prohibition, or banning alcohol sales in the United States. He believed that alcohol was the root of many evils in society, such as poverty, crime, violence, and broken homes. He campaigned for prohibition laws, and he supported the 18th Amendment that made prohibition national policy in 1919. He also supported women's suffrage and tighter child labor laws. Now, Billy represented and defended the fundamentalist movement, which emerged in response to the challenges of modernism and liberalism in theology and culture. He affirmed the literal interpretation of the Bible and the core doctrines of Christianity, such as the virgin birth, the atonement, the second coming of Christ, etc. He also opposed the theory of evolution and criticized the social gospel movement. Now, in some ways, a fundamentalist of Sunday's time is a garden variety evangelical of today, where today's fundamentalists are withdrawn from society, even Christian society. Sunday was not. He was fully engaged. Sunday was no stranger to controversy. He was accused of being a money grabber who exploited his popularity for personal gain. He charged a hefty fee for his services, and he received a percentage of the collections from his revivals. He also lived in a luxurious mansion in Winona Lake, Indiana. His mansion was a 14-room home called Mount Hood that was built in the arts and crafts style, and you can actually visit it today as a museum. He was involved in political controversy when he supported the U.S.'s entry into World War I, and he denounced pacifists and socialists as traitors. He also blamed the Spanish flu pandemic on the Germans, claiming that they had spread germs as part of their propaganda. He urged his followers to buy liberty bonds, and he supported the war effort throughout. Billy Sunday was one of the most popular and controversial figures of his time. He was loved by many who admired his zeal, his sincerity, and his message. He was disliked by others who criticized his theology, his methods, and his politics, He faced opposition from skeptics, liberals, Catholics, socialists, bootleggers, 
and even some fellow evangelicals. But he never backed down from what he believed and what he preached, and he was used mightily to spread the gospel throughout the country. Billy Sunday died on November 6, 1935 in Chicago. He was 72 years old, and he left behind a legacy of faith and influence that shaped American Christianity and culture in the early 20th century. He also paved the way for other evangelists who would follow him, men like Billy Graham. He was definitely a giant of the faith. I appreciate you listening. Until next time, God bless. <laughs>